Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. So my name is Rene. I'm working at VOD. I'm working in the innovation management at VOD and also doing consultancy over our VOD Academy, where we are supporting and helping other companies and institutions on the path on transformation towards sustainability. And yeah, uh, I'm working in the industry now since uh, uh, since a long time, since almost two decades. And yeah, been also across the Europe in different companies been present and always in the material sector. And I focused in the beginning mostly on textiles, but now I'm going more upstream in the chemistry. And yeah, I just hope it will be not too technical, but I will give my best that it won't be that, that you will just get the most of it out of it. Yeah, polyester, we know that uh, it is the most used material in the textile world, especially also in the sportswear world. And it was for most companies the easiest way to set up brand material goods, going more sustainable by switching to recycled polyester, and mainly coming then from bottles. It was like a really good feedstock. It was a high purity feedstock, or it is a high purity feedstock and it's very widely available. And it was easy then just to change to this feedstock. The problem is just a bit that uh, now, due to like um, legislation which is coming up and also towards uh, what the end consumer is thinking about that, it's also a question, do we taking out now some feedstock from an industry which is already doing it in a circle or trying to doing it more in a circle and that we are cannibalizing this bottle industry while taking out zero feedstock and yeah so there are some companies who made already some pledges to go away from the plastic bottles as a feedstock for the polyester and there are also companies who are exploring alternative types of polyester biodegradable types also of polyester uh, as a potential solution. But yeah, um, it's a long pass and it's, I guess, for everybody now a bit tricky to see where are the alternatives uh, for the bottles because uh, the problem is that the bottles are kind of, from the price perspective, kind of cheap. It's easy to implement and also from the quality perspective, there's not much loss in the quality of um, the recycled polyester. But when we're looking um, now on the regulatory side, there's coming up the ESPR, the Equity Design for Sustainable Product Regulation. We don't know when it will be in place. Um, the earliest day, which would be possible, might be in 2027, but potentially it will be in 2030. But um, also here it's mentioned that the bottles are not seen as a sustainable feedstock for textiles, for recycled polyester material. So, and they are also emphasizing more like the textile to textile recycling. And um, it's also like the thing, okay, good, then we're just taking up the textile to textile recycling, easy, but you also know that's a long way, we have to go there. When we're looking now on the consumption of PET, so this graph was shown on the Textile Exchange Summit in 2002. It was in Dublin, I guess. Please correct me. It was in Dublin, no? Yeah. And uh, it was the guy from NAPCOR showing this, uh, like, how is the distribution of the PET? And you can see the majority really goes into fibers, not really into bottles or containers, meaning we are taking out now from this part here quite a lot, meaning it would be not anymore that easy for those bottling companies to just hold on to their own feedstock, depending on the area. In Europe, it is there that we have like uh, a lot of, um, like uh, due to the plastic packaging, plastic waste, bah, PPWR, plastic packaging waste directive, uh, we have here the aim to just have 25% uh, recycled content in the beverage containers by 2025, so by next year already. And also those beverage companies have set themselves uh, very high ambitious um, like goals to increase the amount of recycled PET in their containers. 
And also when we're looking on the traditional mechanical bottle-to-bottle -bottle recycling process, there's a loss in the process of 25%. So 25% of the material is just simply gone. And this has been also visualized in several studies I've seen to this, meaning even so if we knew if the bottling industry is doing now the bottle-to-bottle -bottle recycling, they still have a loss in the process of like 25%, which they need to compensate by fresh material, by new material, or by even other recycled material. Meaning, in fact, there will not be enough recycled PET uh, from the bottles available, especially in Europe and in the foreseen future, also in Asia. Because here also there will come up regulations, legislations, that they should increase also the recycled content in the beverage containers. In our industry, we're talking always about polyester. But uh, polyester, there is like a misunderstanding, I would say. So because we should talk more about the PET, because that's the material what we're mostly using. Because polyester itself, that's the material family. So under this material family, there are several different types. There are about 30 different types of polyester, even like a capo, uh, even, even like a, a polycarbonate is a polyester type, but uh, you cannot spin this into fibers. And PET, so that's not the pet like, like the animal at home. So PET, so polyethylene terephthalate, that's one polyester material type. And this is the one what we're using predominantly. And it's a widely used fiber globally. It was a market share of over 50% worldwide. I guess it's even increasing now. And uh, it's like produced, conventional PET is produced from, from the crude uh, oil or um, also from um, natural gas, meaning it's not really sustainable. And even if we're using recycled bottles, the original feedstock was in the end crude oil, so fossil feedstocks, which is also not that good. And that's really important now where I'm coming now onto it. So PET consists out of two ingredients, so two parts. So one part is the monoethylene glycol, and the other part is the terephthalate acid. So those parts I need to make, in the end, the polyethylene, um, uh, to make the uh, PET. So the share is about 30% of the MEG and 70% of the PTA. There are some solutions out there for the MEG, so I can substitute this one ingredient with some alternative feedstock, but the other part is still a bit tricky because of availability, scalability of technology, that's the way to go. But uh, also when you're seeing now new technologies coming up here like CCU, yarn, Usually, it's only the MEG part which is substituted with it. So you have then 30% of an alternative feedstock, 70% still remaining fossil fuel feedstock. When we're looking over the years now of the global fiber production, we see that the increase in polyester was really dramatical in the last decades, and it's still increasing. And it's also due to the fact that polyester is widely adopted. It's, from the price perspective, very affordable. It got really good properties, what we, especially in the sportswear industry, needs. And um, you also can see how many different material types are we using in our industry. And frankly speaking, it's not that much, We're using perhaps like five different synthetic types uh, over the last 20 years or even um, since the last 30 years, and there are not no more new material types coming up on a widely scale. It's just still like those five material types, predominantly like the polyester with the PET on that. And in, according to Textile Exchange, in uh, 2002, we had a consumption, like a fiber production volume of uh, 63 million tons. And yeah, the market share here from um, like a recycled PET, it's very low when you're comparing it to the overall global consumption of raw virgin PET. And we see there's textile to textile recycling coming up. It's, uh, it's the ramping up. 
especially in Far East, like in China, where you also see here a lot of uh, opportunities and a lot of possibilities where you can use like textile feedstock as a potential solution for it. But uh, in Europe, we are still lagging a bit behind. It's still what you have seen also in the news, very difficult to create like a viable business model from that. Even so in Europe, we do not really have, unfortunately, a traditional PET value chain anymore. So even a lot of spinning companies in Europe, they're getting their ships, PET ships, from China, or they're getting it from the US or from Turkey. So it's like challenging in the end to build up here like a value chain for the PET in Europe. Yes, in growing interest in those ocean plastic or ocean-bound plastic, I would more call it curbside collection. Um, where we are having also now more uh, certifications on that. If you have questions, you can ask them also later. I will not go in deep into the ocean-bound plastics here. And the market share of bio-based polyester, that's really low. That's about 0.01%, mainly due to the price, but also a lot of people have some concerns. Also a bit strange because they have con um, the concerns of natural-based polymers or natural-based feedstock more than it's like on fossil feedstock. But that's unfortunately the fact. So the question is now, so what we can do now? We see now we have now a big problem because we're using predominantly, at Vaudé as well, predominantly recycled PET from the bottles, but we need to change that. And here to see like the overall uh, roof of that, I would like to introduce you again the uh, concept of the renewable carbon. And that's really important. Now it looks now a bit fancy, I can say, uh, but it's really important that you understand the concept of renewable carbon. Because the renewable carbon actually can come from different kind of sources. It can come from the biosphere, from the atmosphere, or from the technosphere, but not from the gyrosphere. So everything from carbons which are below the ground, they are bad. Everything from the carbons which are above the ground, they are good. In the end, we need to come like in a, to a carbon cycle economy because we cannot say in our industry we are doing like a decarbonization of our materials because you all consist probably out of carbon. I just hope so. <laughs> and and um, also all the plants consist out of carbon, all life consists out of carbon. So we cannot talk about a decarbonization in our industry when it comes to materials, because we need the carbons. Otherwise, we would do, we need to make everything out of metal. And it's probably not that comfortable, I would say, and also not that sustainable. So similar, like the concept of the renewable energy, which everybody understands and also knows, there are basically three different input streams where you can get the renewable energy from, so from solar, wind, and hydro energy. The same concept we need to apply to the carbon, to the renewable carbon, so to our materials. And also here we're having three different input streams and not more, it's like CO2, it's like biomass, and it's, re and the, and it's and the recycling. While recycling will be the most crucial one which we need to take up, but also followed then by the CCU, by the, so by the CU as a CO2 as a potential feedstock. But in this presentation, I will not go too much into detail of the CCU, of the carbon capture and utilization. Even so, you see here some examples on the show, some providers who are providing you like with a CCU-based polyester. Again, it's just the MEG part, the 30%, which are coming from carbon. So from uh, CO2, the remaining 70% part is still coming from fossil fuels. Uh, main reason why I'm not going too much into detail here is that um, now since it was two weeks ago, the European Parliament have accepted CCU as a net zero uh, technology. And so now all the aviation companies, uh, they made now like commitments to use it for like uh, for the SAF, for the sustainable aviation fuel. So e-fuels for like um, the, um, yeah, for the aviation. And therefore the whole market of the CO2 goes now more into the aviation. 
meaning in about five to 10 years, it will be more interesting definitely for our industry as well. Now it's a good starting point to investigating it and also to see what kind of certifications are available also a bit critical, and it needs to have a lot more acceptance still uh, on the political side, especially in Europe. I don't know how the status is in the US or in that Asia. In the US, I guess uh, it's more, for, um, it's, it's, I guess, a, a bit better than in Europe, but uh, we are lagging a bit behind, but the technology is there. So the technology is there, we just need to scaling it up. When it comes to recycling, like everybody sees and uh, thinks about Texa to Texa recycling, we have here accelerating circularity at the performance days where you can inform yourself about that. Still to say it's a long way to go and it's not the only solution. Because if we only focusing on Texa to Texa recycling, it would mean in the end that we need feedstock, we need waste. Because in which areas recycling kind of works. It's like on single-use plastics, like on, uh, like on packaging. But do we want that our clothes becoming like single-use products? I don't think so. It will not be like, um, like really sustainable if we're just using our products just one time and just throwing them in the bin. So we need to be careful on that. But on the other hand, we also have the responsibility uh, to have like end-of-life perspective for our products. Therefore, the textile, the textile recycling is really important. When we come now to one of the other columns, like so the bio-based, here one example, what we did together with UPN, I see them standing over there, hello. <laughs> um, we uh, collaborated, or we are um, um, collaborating with UPN, it's a Finnish company, it's a Finnish uh, wood processing company, one of the largest ones in the world. They're investing 1.3 3 billion euro, uh, yeah, 1.3 billion euro in building one of the largest bio refineries in Germany and processing here like wood waste, wood residues, and, and they're transforming it to the MEG, to a bio MEG. And also, and uh, with this one, we made like a prototype last year on the ISPO, we, exp we, we just displayed it on the ISPO to make like a fleece jacket, you can see it here. Um, where one part of the polyester is made from the dedicated uh, MEG, so bio-based MEG. That's now the first milestone for us, not the last milestone. And you see also here a picture from our Federal Minister of Environment and the Federal Minister of Environment from Brazil, who, um, who were visiting UPM um, last year and also with our products, so it got high reputation already and high recognition of that one. And the next phase here for us is where also we need the help of the industry, of you all, is to uh, make the PTA, the remaining 70% also kind of bio-based, also including it. And that's why we want to use like the BioNAFTA from UPM as well um, to transform it then um, into paraxylene and then into terephthalate acid. So, and then combining it with the MEG and making them like a virgin grade or like a, yeah, at, at, at identical quality PET, granulate and fiber, um, like we're using it today. And this was a footprint which is, goes almost down to zero with a carbon footprint. So uh, that's the way we are going and it's also the potential for future like um, projects uh, to look for other feedstock sources for the PET. But of course, you still need to ask yourself, is PET really the best material for your product? Or are you just using it because it's cheap? Um, and that's a good question. Because when you think as a designer, as a developer, you should have an hand, OK, what material fits best to it? Is it really PET, or is it maybe polyamide? Is it the polyamide 6? Is it a polyamide 6 6? Maybe it's also like a natural material. Maybe wool is for your product the best suitable material. So you should not select your material just only on the carbon footprint you get. You should select it from if it's fitting the best to it, like if it has the, um, the properties you need for your product. And there are, of course, also alternative polyester, because I mentioned polyester is a material family. It's not a single specific type and there are different types underneath it. And the textiles also very 
uh, present is a PTT. You know it as an, uh, under the name Sorona from Covation Biomaterials, where like 37% uh, of this material in the end is biobase, coming mostly from corn, cornstarch. The remaining part is still, um, yeah, fossil base. Uh, it's been used often when you want to have like this mechanical stretch polyester. So when somebody is going to a supplier and saying, hey, I want to have like a mechanical stretch polyester, I want to avoid like spandex to have an enhanced recycling, then they're going often uh, using like a PTT into that one, like a co-polyester um, to have this kind of stretch into it. Problem is a bit, it's a different material type. Got a different melting point, got different um, properties. So in the texta to texta recycling, it might be a challenge, depending on the recycling technology. And you cannot really talk about like a mono material. It is a polyester, but it's not a PET only. The other one is PLA, polylactate acid. Um, that's 100% bio-based coming from different sources like uh, cornstarch or um, sugarcane. That's the most predominantly sources uh, for PLA. And uh, a lot of companies also advertising it as biodegradable. And yes, it's, it's biodegradable, but under really certain conditions. So like under specific industrial composition, uh, 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 under industrial com um, the composting, conditions. It is biodegradable, but uh, those are conditions which are not been found in the reality, so in the, the real life, in the environment. So you need to be careful. You can modify the PLA, that it's easier, biodegradable, compostable, but so far just under specific conditions. And also you need to still to think, what is the end of life perspective? Is it recyclable? In fact, it is recyclable, but um, I don't know any um, waste streams and recycling streams for the PLA. But it's also potential is from the price perspective, one of the cheapest uh, bio-based materials and bio-based polymers. And that's why it's also very attractive, especially for the packaging industry. But please keep in mind about the potential end of life of the material. The last one I want to present is the PHA. Sorry, I'm not a chemist and I cannot pronounce the detailed name of it. Please Google it. It's really difficult. Maybe somebody from the audience can maybe say it later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, those are bio-based polymers. Uh, it's also like a group of polymers. It encompasses like 150 different types, so really complex. They are bio-based, also out from different sources you can make them and they are completely biodegradable under, so far, all conditions, depending, of course, on your compound, what kind of additives you might have in there. And this is completely biodegradable. And even like the recent studies shown faster than like some cellulosic material, even under marine conditions. Um, the problem a bit from my knowledge is that the shelf life of the PHA is really short. It's about six months, and then it starts to degrade in the environment. So you need to optimize it maybe a bit further. But when you want to have a solution for microplastics, that's a potential one. But uh, does it provide long-lasting products? This will be difficult uh, to explore. There are two companies right now, so Mango Materials uh, on the West Coast in the US. They're exploring it to make like yarns out of that. So far, they have not really succeeded on a large scale. They're using it more now for like injection molded items. And there was also the news coming up. It was like, yeah, just a few weeks ago from the North Face, who are also now investigating more the PHA as a potential solution for the PET. And uh, yeah, the PHA is out there for like 10, 15, 20 years already. On the, but it's not been scaled up to a commercial level, to the widely commercial level. This also shows you uh, how long it takes to introduce like a new material type in the world. So it takes usually 30 years until it's been really commercialized and on a commercial level. 
With this one, I'd like to wrap up. So what you can take with you is now that PET is the most used polyester type. And when we're talking about polyester, we're predominantly talking about PET, especially when it comes to textile to textile recycling. And the use of bottles as a feedstock is being phased out, not right now, but in the next three years, also due to the customer awareness, because they're also understanding it now more and more that the bottles are maybe not the most sustainable feedstock for your products. And um, first, alternative feedstocks, they are available. They are now available. You can see them here on the show, on the boards in the hall C2, is it? And um, please remember the concept of the renewable carbon, that there are three different kind of input streams you can have, and you should not balance them out. So you should not say, OK, um, recycling is better than biomass. Biomass is better than CCU. You should not do that. It's always depending. And it's depending also on how fit you are on LCA measurements. Because if you are fit on LCA measurements, you can calculate more or less everything to net zero. So, um, Please be careful on that. And most important, always choose the most sustainable material for your application. No, as the most suitable, sorry, so the, so the most suitable material for your application. Because on the long run, it comes to durability, longevity, that's also the main objective of the ESPR, longevity, durability of a product, and this will make an even also the most sustainable product so it's not something new. We had it 30 years ago, 40 years ago in our products. We need to go a bit more back from our personal thinking. And with this one, I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, René. Let's wait a second to bring everything down. So for everything which you mentioned on the wrap-up, can you go back that slide? So as I assume, there are lots of solutions within your head because you were one of the technical drivers behind the brands you worked for and of course for all the organization and associations. But now, looking at all our faces, looking at all our like in-depth knowledge, take the moment to share whatever you think on it and ask whether the right questions or already give answers. Because in here, it could be like 10 hours with René <laughs> approaching all the opportunities we have and we could also call it problems we have in our daily lives and our choosing of the opportunities and if it comes to my own thinking I'm like okay okay but if do you say it's manipulating if it's the careful judgment of the figures and you can like manage everything to a neutral one of course you do but where's where's the ending where's the beginning because somehow we need to start so there's lots of opportunities in everything you were saying and before I ask all the questions please do it yourself, ask questions or give answers um, to this topic of the show. I hoped you are the first one. <laughs> so for all the comments, questions and answers, please enter your name in your thing, what you're doing, as um, you give the perfect example, please. So I'm Mark Taylor, work at the University of Leeds. I've got a comment and then a question. Um, PHA, PHBs, really interesting. But my understanding is they're actually too crystalline to spin into yarns, which is why people are really struggling. I know there are teams all over the world, including in Leeds, trying to solve this, but it's not easy. Uh, and then my question, UPM's bio-based naphtha, is that from a similar process to origin materials you're using to extract the, f the raw ingredients of PET from cellulose? I hope I make it now right. Uh, Marvin, please correct me, or David, yeah, David, please correct me if I'm not. Um, so the BioNafta from UPM, that's a process they developed in 2015. Um, they're using as a feedstock tal oil. So tal oil, uh, so tal oil is coming from pines. Um, so in the pulping process, the tal oil is a residue which is generated. And over the process of UPM, they are able to refining it, converting it into a naphtha. And this naphtha can also go into biofuels, which right now also been used, but also in like other 
like plastic products. Important here, that's like the really first uh, step in the material creation. So you need to go then e so, so either through a refining process or like to the steam cracker process. And you need to use the mass balance allocation. Can you, can you switch on the microphone for Mark again, please? Sorry, Mark. Maybe I turned it off. Um, yeah, so it's different to the one Origin using them because they're using cellulose as their feedstock. They have the um, microphone in here. What's that for? Yeah. yeah. Of course they have. <laughs> oh. It's not on, Marvin. Locked. Okay. Um, Please introduce First of your all, name and your uh, sorry, company. Okay. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, I'm Marvin. Uh, I'm working for UPM, yeah? so uh, we're delighted working with René. And first of all, wow, René. I mean, I have the feeling 100% we told you were in, uh, was in your mind. Yeah? So uh, usually, I don't know, 80% of the stuff we tell people is gone, but good job. Yeah. Um, then with regard to your question with origin, yeah? I mean, uh, well, I now need to watch out, but... It was very uh, prominent case, very good marketing, we need to admit, so I love marketing, but uh, in the way there were days they had a market, capitaliz a market capitalization of $1 billion, yeah? I think today they are at 60. Yeah? Um, yeah, the bubble basically exploded, so I think the technology is not yet mature. We cross fingers because it's important that we get the other 70% on a bio base. And we would be, in the end, delighted to bring yin and yang together yeah, for polyester. So bio MEG and a bio PTA. Yeah? Um, but frankly speaking, I would have my doubts that the next five years, something really on a pure, non-mass balanced bio PTA is coming up. Yeah? So I only mentioned Origin because they commercialized that technique. But there's been work done at the University of York in the UK as well, using cellulose as a feedstock to make basically bio-based PET. But that's why it's interesting, sir. But it will work. It's a question which technology, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And obviously offers the promise that you don't have to get your cellulose from a tree. It could come from paper or cardboard or other waste streams. Even, even viscose or something like that could be turned into PET. That's quite exciting, isn't it? Or not? Well, there's indeed a variety. I mean, we as UPM, let's say, coming from the forest industry, uh, we for sure um, having side streams we are just upgrading instead of uh, really uh, burning the material where all the CO2 is released back to the atmosphere again. Yeah, So uh, we think we can do something better to the environment. Yeah? Absolutely. So, and uh, I'm, I'm, I do not really want to step in because that's exactly the way of discussions we need. Have you ever worked together with that project, Mark, for the university? So this, yeah, if I'm allowed for a call to action, that would be one. Because if it's, if it's not us accelerating the knowledge, it's Mark Taylor. Maybe you can stand up so that everybody sees your face for questions. All around this, Mark is um, closely working together with Charles, together with the programs here, and together with lots of students and with a lot of accelerating knowledge for all of that. Um, so any more questions? It's Pia in here having the open microphone. Do we have more questions? Thank you, and thank you for contributing. Thank you for contributing. You can over, hand over the microphone as well, please. It's working. To yeah. cho choose anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Is this? Yeah, no, it's working. Thank you. Um, question about the first three topics. Ideally, with yeah. name and yes. wherever. Oh, sorry about that. My company. name is João Matias. I work for YKK, a zipper button manufacturer. Question about the first three topics. Um, polyester is the main material that we've been using in the industry for decades. That's probably not going to change in the next few decades either. Bottles as a feedstock being phased out, that is true, but very, very slow. And alternative feedstocks now available. Also good, but everything is kind of like pilot plant scale. Um, small companies that have pilot plants, big companies that have pilot plants too. So um, I don't really see right now any new change big change happening, but we're probably going to keep using poly polyester for a while, not without bottles, but chemically recycled polyester is very expensive right now. And um, although we do make zippers with chemically recycled polyester, it is expensive, so not a lot of people are buying it. Um, what do you think about the chemical recycling? Is it PET chemical recycling, do you think this, this is going to be the n new big thing 
or any of those materials that you introduced, which one do you think is going to come first? Yeah, thanks for the question. So we were definitely we were definitely using PET for the next decades for sure, and also all the upcoming recycling projects they are aiming PET. Um, I think it's a lot about the customer awareness about here. So even if the legislation they are set up and they will come, we don't know how fast it will come, but it will come. But it's also the customer acceptance, and we see it already, that the customers are not really seeing it anymore as a sustainable product. So that's for us as a brand really difficult to marketing it then as a sustainable product and not facing any greenwashing allegations on that. And that for that thing, and yes, you're absolutely right, all the alternatives, they are not all on scale, not really on commercial scale, some are, but they are definitely more expensive. And especially with the chemical recycling, that's definitely more expensive because you have more processes in it, like uh, on a mechanical recycling, but you also have the potential to valorize post-consumer feedstock and not having all the toxic stuff which might be in there in your product, depending on the recycling technology and chemical recycling technology. Um, it's often also about the acceptance of chemical recycling. It's still not 100% there, it's getting there, but as the acceptance is not really there, it's also not the European Commission, for example, in Europe, is really accepting this as one feasible recycling technology, which is complementary to the mechanical recycling, then of course the investment from the large companies, it's also a bit lagging. But still the large companies, they're investing a lot of money into those, really a lot of money into those technologies. Um, and yes, it is definitely more expensive, so all the alternatives we will have then will be more expensive, but if you consider now to use back virgin um, PET, you also have seen the update of the EcoInvent database, which I have increased now um, the CO2 emissions of the fossil fuel plastics like PET, PE, and PP. So it was for PET plus 27% uh, up on the greenhouse gas emissions. When you're combining it then with a carbon tax, which is coming up, or which is there, and will also increase the carbon tax, then you need to balance it out. So, of course, everything will be more expensive, but we also need to agree that our products are a bit too cheap, how much um, the craftsmanship is beyond those. Okay, thank you. One question back. YKK, yes, Anya. If you see yourself as one of the biggest players, how far are you into that topic, and where is it, like, leaded in the company? Chemical recycling, you mean? Mm. Um, how do you contribute, or where is the corporation standard? Well, we have our own developments going on, but because the market response is not very positive, there is not a lot of encouragement to invest more time and money into that. Because if you don't see the return, then, you know, it's a very big risk. So we need more support from brands to really step into this initiative. Yeah. Although, you see. Wonderful part being the moderator and not being part of uh, the normal life. So this is, uh, if, it's, if it's not you asking the brands for collaboration and if it is uh, what you're saying, risk, it, may, it might be a financial risk, but the other side of the risk is not going for change. So I highly accelerate your wish to visit Carla Magruder for Accelerating Circularity, to use the partnerships you already have. I know you have some towards closing the loop and um, recycling basis. So the last call, to, are there some more questions? And this is like, use this show for collaboration aspects to bring it home. Because it's you now as the eyes and the ears of your company. And if it's not you, who then? This is a conversation we already. For sure. Yeah. So um, more questions and more comments? Yes. Is the Microsoft phone still over there with you? Yes. Pia can, yeah, thank you. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Elena Pini from Rudolf. Uh, it's a chemical company, and my question is very simple. How we, we believe in, uh, in this change, we want to participate to the change. We already, you know, uh, do a lot of R&D and efforts for producing, you know, new, chem new chemistry, I would say. 
with all the difficulties then in, into the supply chain because uh, then uh, the supports and the, the fabrics, the materials behaves differently. But we would like, uh, the question is how to, uh, we are available to participate to any project which are difficult to find because there is a, a, you know, a long, uh, big distance with, uh, to, to the brands or also the supply chain to, do not do how to be part of the change or how simply to participate to a project that makes the change. So the question is how to apply for. <laughs> Super good question. Thank yeah, you, because that question. would be one of one of hundreds who have the same question. Yeah. So, René. Yeah, no, that's a good question. It's yeah. easy also, and it's also like an easy answer. You need to go upstream. So you need to go upstream in your value chain. So not talking also only to your direct supplier. You need to talk to the supplier of your supplier and the supplier of your the supplier of your supplier. <laughs> so you really need to go upstream in the chemical industry, really starting on the beginning and then talking to the companies there. They are very open. We have seen, for the example, with the UPM, they were very open about that and this is how you can start those collaborations and also you can engage with those large organizations also other potential partners who are at the ramping uh, like a new project up so you not own voice need like uh, any kind of funded project for this and the recommendation from my side would also be accelerating circularity because there's cindy from one again and she will have recommendations that Renee has with the right network. So join the forums and ask exactly that questions. And there are key people here, which you find exactly in the forums. And Cindy from one again is one. Thank you. Some more impulses, some more questions. Thanks <coughs> for location. I come from Taiwan. We are involved in the chemical recycle. And I can give you the information that chemical recycle will be happening very soon, and that's not expensive. The expense, expensive is how to collect the waste, the transportation. Because today's the technology of the chemical recycling is, is can be cheaper than the virgin. So that is I would like to share you uh, I come from Edai, so we are working stuff from the mono material, from the trims, from the fabrics, even from the sewing thread. That is workable. Time is up. So it's, the process is not expensive. Just for your reference. Thank you. Thank you, George. <coughs> Thanks for contributing. Solutions all around. We just need to be aware and scale. Anything else to add? Otherwise, thank you so much for contributing to the topic, facilitating the show for this huge thing. If there is uh, no port to share, I would love to invite you to the next speech, which is Alexa Demel, um, expert on all the forum information here on performance days. She's giving a speech on Innovation Zone and on Footwear Forum. I will leave the last words to you as a call to action if there is one. But of course, we need to listen to the next invitation first. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, just, um, yeah. just contact me. Thank you.